Hello class, uh, welcome to this next lecture. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make sure that everyone has a working environment and knows how to get Julia installed and running, right? So remember that we're gonna be using Julia because we're going to be looking at parallel programming and we're going to be looking at how to really optimize some serial code. And so we're going to we need to make sure that we have a language where we can start to you know look at assembly and everything. So if you haven't used Julia before, we'll I'll basic go into some of the basics here. But really, the the first lecture in in how do you optimize serial code will be the one that has all, all the all the meats. You know that'll be really where we're starting the course. So if you haven't installed it before, um, I highly recommend that the way that you install it is you go to julialang.org and then you hit download any download from these in, uh, from these generic binaries. If you're using Ubuntu, which I assume that a lot of people, you know, especially at MIT, will do, do not use the one that comes with APT. All right, so do not do, not do APT-get. Um, do not, you know, if you're using Nix OS or one of these, you know, one of these weird, you know, versions of Linux, do not use the package installer because a lot of times what, what happens is that they, those might bundle with a different version of LLVM, LLVM is this uh, uh, this compiler that is used underneath the hood, and that can cause some difficulties, right? A lot of standard uses can be okay, but when you're starting to do want to do things like uh, you know generate GPU code, or you know when you're looking into the assembly and making sure that it's getting the right you know SIMD vectors, um, those can be affected if you have a, a wrong version of LLVM. And so these generic Linux binaries are probably the best idea for if you're on Linux. Or you can build it yourself by just going to the to the Julie Lang repository, if that may, is what makes you most comfortable. So you can go to Julie Lang slash Julia, and the build instructions are right here on the repository itself. So if th that's how you want to do it, then go for it. But you, you should be perfectly fine using the generic binaries. If you're on Mac, there's a binary. If you're on Windows, there's a binary as well. Right, so th this, this is where what we recommend. For this course, we're going to be using version 1.5. And then if 1.6 comes out during the course, we might switch to there. But it should all be non-breaking changes. Um, you shouldn't be using the long-term support version 1.0.5, just because some of the newer tools, a lot of the automatic differentiation tools, a lot of the GPU acceleration tools will not be compatible, or at least the only their older versions will be compatible with this version. So definitely you want to be on the current stable release. So when you get Julia installed, um, you're going to probably want to use an IDE, right? Unless you're someone who wants to use Vim or Emacs, do your, do your thing, right? Um, but the IDE that a lot of people use is either Juno or VS Code. So Juno is the one that I prefer. I'm going to be showing showcasing a lot of Juno. Um, it looks like, oh, it looks like it's it's not switching over. So I'm going to need to do a different cut uh, to to show my uh, other screens there. But um, so the, so Juno is built onto Atom. So the what you'd have to do in order to install that is you would go to Atom, and you would install this uh, IDE. And what, what Juno is, is it's a plugin for the Atom IDE. So you install the IDE, and then you, um, and then inside of the Atom IDE, I'll show in a second, that you go in and you, um, what's the word? You install the plugin, which is the, the Uber Juno plugin. The documentation on that is at docs.julia, uh, or junolab.org. So, the, this is the documentation where it has the installation instructions right here. That's docs.junolab.org. This right now is the most popular IDE, though there is a new IDE which is uh, which is kind of coming out soon. So if you want to see, uh, well, it, the VS Code IDE has already come out, and there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot more that's going on um, in development for right now. So you might want to start moving over to it um, if you want to get a. Uh, a high-level overview of a lot of what, what that is, take a look at uh, this this JuliaCon talk, which is fairly recent, which is JuliaCon 2020, using VS Code for Julia development, right? This this right here will go through how all the nice features of the Julia um, VS Code uh, plugin, which essentially has a lot of things like uh, being able to do remote computing on the cloud and everything directly from in the plugin. So. If you're more familiar with VS Code, feel free to use VS Code. I'll be showing more of Juno, but even during the semester, I might be doing the switch because as a community, a lot of people are doing the switch. And again, if you want to just have the REPL open, you can just you know install a REPL and copy paste things into the REPL. That is completely perfectly fine. Um, 
it's just most people feel a little bit more comfortable with an IDE. So I'd kind of recommend that if if you want, you know, get get one of these IDEs installed. So let me cut and then jump into that IDE. So here I'm inside of the Atom IDE. So Atom is a text editor where you can have a plugin for it to make it be IDs for different uh, different packages or for different languages, right? So um, what I'm what I do here is I normally use this Juno plugin. The way that you would get that is you would go to settings and then you go to install, and then if you type in Uber Juno, this is a meta package which installs all of the um, packages that are required in order to um, get the full Julia ID in installed. So in a second here, this will pop up, and this is the Uber Juno package, which what it'll do is it'll install a lot of sub packages. Now, when you install Uber Juno, uh, one of the pack sub packages you might need to make it, be aware of is the Julia client package, right? Because if you're on something like Windows, if if Julia is not in your path, so if you have not set up Julia such that you know it's in your path like this, then you do need to make sure that you add the Julia path to the to the IDE. So that way it knows where, how to find um, the Julia installation. When you do that, you should have all these nice windows pop up. And when you hit enter in the REPL, it should start up Julia. And the first time it should install the packages that are required for the Juno IDE. Um, so I've already installed it before, but on your screen, what you will have seen is probably something like installing atom.jl, installing juno.jl. You know, have a whole list of packages that install automatically to then make this be running. Right. If this is not running, most likely what happened is um, your Julia path might have been wrong. Now, no matter what uh, IDE you're using, one of the things that you might want to make sure of is that you have everything set up for parallelism and multi-threading, right? Because that's going to be a core component of this course. So if you do uh, threads dot um, uh, num threads, I think it is. Uh, Oh, and threads. So using uh, base dot threads, oops, uh, threads dot n threads. So here I get six. So I have a six core computer and I have six threads enabled. That is good. So the reason why that, that should work out for you if you're using Juno is because um, it has this threads auto mode. In, if you're using the VS Code extension, then you need to make sure that you set the, the number of threads. Otherwise, if you are if you're using you know Vim or Emacs or something, make sure that there's a uh, uh, there is a Julia num threads uh, environment variable that you need to set. So you might want to set that in your .bash RC or however you're doing your higher level um, uh, what, however you're doing your higher level options to make sure that you have the right number of threads. Right? Because if you have one thread, then no matter how much multi-threading you do on in your code, you're still going to only have one thread. Um, now, the basic way that you walk around Julia and get your packages installed is you hit this, uh, you hit the close bracket, right? So close bracket changes you into the package REPL, and this brings up this blue window, right? So when you see the blue window, this means that it's now in the package mode, and I can do things like, oh, let me let me zoom this in a bit. Here, I'll zoom it into insane levels, and I think that'll be perfect for a video. There you go. Yeah, so now I'm gonna do something like add, oh. hold on, maybe I zoomed too far. Let me clear my window and, okay. Yeah, it doesn't like that amount of zoom. Um, all right, so let me do something like uh, add finite diff. All right, so that's how you add a package. Um, this will add the finite diff package for finite differencing. It'll automatically pull it off the Julia general repository and uh, put it into my thing. So that way I can do using finite diff. All right, and we'll go into how Julia packages work in, in, in a little bit. Um, now, uh, one of the things that you'll want to do for a lot of your a lot of your homework assignments is you're going to want to use a environment, right? So when I click here, this says that I'm using the version 1.5 environment. Um, you want to use probably an environment for each project. So every every time that you're working on a project, you want to make sure that everything that you're doing is fully reproducible, right? Yeah. 
essentially you want to have like a, a docker version of just your julia right so that way someone can just go go to here and then automatically instantiate all the packages that you use so that way they no matter who they are they'll get the same result right um so now uh, let me check where this is putting me so here i'm on my desktop you can see i have my desktop folder open here you can do add project folder to you know add other folders in here so for example if i want to add this pack so here i already have the desktop in and i want to create an environment in here to start working in so what I can do is I can activate an environment and I would do activate uh, demo one, right? So demo one will now be, uh, will now get a folder in here. Well, when I start uh, modifying it. So now let me add some packages. So let me do something like uh, add finite div and forward diff. So what this is going to do is it's going to populate this demo one folder with a project which says exactly what package is. So this is the pa package name and this is the UUID. So that way if there's, you know, packages can come from all sorts of repositories. People can have private packages inside of, you know, their company and such. And so you can have different repositories in, that can have different names, but this UUID is the unique identifier, right? So if you, if you don't do anything, then by default, you're grabbing everything from the general repository, which is the open source one. And so this is, here I've gotten the finite diff package from the general repository. And I've gotten the forward diff package from the general repository. And this manifest is then a capture of all of the packages and all of the versions, right? Because forward diff, uh, it requires that you, uh, it requires using the package nanmath. And so it installed nanmath at version 0 0.3.4, right? So this is a full, in, you know, this is a full store of our entire state that tells us all the packages we used. Now, the ones that don't have a version on here, what they are is their uh, their packages from the standard library. So printf is something that ships with Julia, and so this will just match the one that it comes with your Julia version. Whereas these other packages like openspecfun.jll, so this is a binary that gets installed for spe for special functions like the gamma function, and um, here, for example, is a macro tools library, which is then just a normal Julia package, which is dependent on these two packages, right? So it has this whole tree in here for all your dependencies and how they work. And so if you work from inside of this folder, then if you instantiate your, your, uh, your TOMLs, your manifest and your project TOMLs, then whoever is working there will get exactly the same, uh, will get exactly the same state, exactly the same packages as you. So now let's start a Julia script in there. So let's do, you know, test.jl. So in order to, inside of Juno, and I think VS Code does this as well, in order to get the syntax highlighting, you do have to make sure that you have a .jl on the end. So if you just created an, a new thing and you're wondering why you're not getting syntax highlighting, it's because you need to have a .jll file open. So a lot of times I just create .jll files with, you know, test.jl. So here, let me start doing something. I'm going to bring in forward diff and finite diff. All right. And now let's uh, let's define a few things. So let's define something like uh, f of x equals 2x squared uh, plus x. And let's do um, forward diff dot gradient of so if you need to get if you need to get more help, you know it'll give you a bit of what's going on inside of the auto completion window, or you can check check the help window by doing uh, you hit the question mark into the command line that opens the help command line, and you do forward diff dot gradient, and then oops forward diff dot gradient, and it tells you what the arguments are, All right? So this is this is how you get get the help. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, uh, for this, I'm going to want to take the derivative of this with respect to the input value of 2. And I'm going to do finite diff dot derivative of f with respect to 2. Uh, finite difference derivative with respect to 2. And they're going to be the same value. Right. So now, uh, let's say that someone else comes to your Julia, or let's say you come back another day. So you 
cut this. So what I did there was Control J, Control uh, Control J, Control K to be to kill Julia, and Control J, Control C to to clear my REPL. So now this is like I left and I come right back, right? Now if I'm restarting Julia, everything from scratch, I might not have all these packages, right? Because you know the packages only exist in in that. Um, in that given spot. So if I was just to instantiate the packages right here, don't quite know what my what my global state is, but if my global state doesn't have these two exact packages, then it's going to throw me an error. And indeed, forward diff is not defined in my global state. I can I can look at this and see this by using st, which is for uh, status. And so this tells me that I have all these packages, which includes finite diff, but does not include forward diff. Right, because forward diff is only inside of my environment. I need to go into that environment if I want to use that package. I mean, I could I could cheat. I can add forward diff to the global here, but usually you, you probably want to be working in, in environments. So how how do you do this? Well, you just activate that environment again. So I'm going to activate demo one, and here now I should be in the state to then be able to rerun this project. Right. Um, now that might be something that is not so nice to do because, well, you'd have to remember to instantiate the demo all the time. So there's a, there's a, there's a nice way to do this, which is, um, you know, so for, you want to, so this macro right here, what it returns is the directory that the file lives in. So if I do something like cd, cd dir, then that means I know that in the, at the top of the script, I'm always going to be um, I'm always going to be at the location of this file. Now I can do something like using pkg and pkg .activate. right? And by default, what this is going to activate or activate dot. So activate dot is going to look for the project toml in the same folder as this file. And so this activated demo one project .toml, right? So if this is at the top of if this is at the top of my script, then if I have a manifest and a project inside of the same folder, then it will give me exactly those package versions every time. So then I run this, and voila, it, it it'll it's reproducible, right? So now I can get all these different package versions. I can do things like um, add uh, finite diff at version 1.2, right, I can do a very specific version of the package. And if someone activates this repository or, or this script uh, with these tomls on, uh, on this spot, then they'll get exactly the same versions no matter what computer they're using. So um, when we're doing our homework problems, make sure that you're doing it in a way such that you're doing it with a project because I want to make sure that I should be able to just open up your script and directly run it and get exactly the same results that you saw because there shouldn't be versioning issues with this. So um, if there are versioning issues, we'll need to make sure that you figure out how to do this correctly. So that's how you do a, a lot of uh, development, or that's how you do a lot of exploratory development in Julia. So you can create your own uh, projects by making a folder with these uh, project and uh, and manifest uh, tomls, and then use that to be able to manage your dependencies and do whatever mm -hmm. analysis that you're trying to do. Now, um, if we want to start creating packages, uh, which is something that we will need to be doing as part of this um, as part as part of this uh, course, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to probably use PKG templates. So PKG templates is a um, so, uh, so PKG templates is a package for building, for, for basically templating out Julia packages. The most basic usage of it is to create a template um, where if you don't have your Git, if you don't have Git set up globally, you will have to give it a username. So you can create this template and then you have to tell it what package name to use. So. Uh, for here, what I want to do is, let's say I want to create a demo one package. And what this will do is this will create all the hooks to create this package. Now, where does that package go? Well, by default, all of your packages live in your .julia folder. So whatever your home directory is, um, so your home directory on Windows is going to be the user, right? Your home directory on Linux or Mac is going to be tilde, right? Wherever, the, wherever tilde is pointing to on your system. 
Um, in there, there's going to be a hidden folder, which is .julia. Inside of, the hit, inside of this .julia folder is where it's going to put this dev folder. Right? And this dev folder is all the packages that you currently have open and are, and are working on. So here it created this demo1 uh, package, which is now empty. Right? And so you do something like uh, add source code here. So let me... So let me, so first of all, to make this, this demo package available on your system, what I want to do is I want to dev demo one. So this makes it, so here it says that I found the path of the package, right? Because it looks inside of your, it looks inside of dev and it found this package and it goes, okay, so this is now a live package. You can use it just like any other package. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set this up to be a package that does exactly what I was looking at here, right? So. Um, let's see. What's it? So, so let's let's do let's throw this code into here. And now, if I'm going to add this code into the package, well, now this package needs to depend on these two other packages. So let me activate demo one, the the project toml inside of my package now, All right? So you just give it the package name, and it knows what to do there. Um, and now I'm going to tell it that I want to add forward diff and finite diff as dependencies inside of this package. And now you can see that inside of here it's created this project toml, which is which says that this package depends on these two other packages, right? Um, it's given it a package name, a package version. It set it all up as a real Julia package because we've used uh, uh, PKG templates. So inside of here, then let me now just define that g of x equals here and g of, uh, and h of x equals here. And now what I want to do is I want to, um, well, so w the one way that I like to develop packages is I like to work directly in test scripts. So here inside of test, there are these uh, test scripts, right? And well, I'll show you exactly how to run the package test in, in a second. But here, let's uh, let's just pull in the package for now. So it's going to pre-compile package, right? So packages, they pre-compile the first time that they're installed or, or the next time that they're updated. So when you're doing some package development, you'll see some pre-compilation. Um, if it's a big package like differential equations or the, or the machine learning libraries, they will pre-compile the first time you install them, but they shouldn't change until the next time you update your packages. So now inside of here, let's start using our package. Right, so in order to reference things inside of the package, we need to use the package name. So let's look at something like uh, demo1.g of 2.0, right, which would calculate 9. And what is demo1.h of 2.0? That should also calculate 9. And so what? And so these two values should be approximately the same, right? One of them is using automatic differentiation, so it's exact. The other one is using uh, finite differencing, so it's not exact. So what I just showed here is that backslash lets you use Unicode characters. You can go fun with this. I have a whole video using only emojis for variable names. Um, but here, the, an interesting one to use is a prox, which is for inexact, inexact equal inequalities. You can also use the approx function. So a prox is a prox, but is a prox AB does not look as nice as that. So personal taste. Um, so here I did a backslash approx as to get this operator, and these should be approximately the same. So now I can bring in this test library and add a test here where the test is passed if it's true, and the test fails if it's false. Mm -hmm. Right. So it just tells me whether this thing is true or false, so you can write arbitrarily hard tests. And now what I want to do is I have this package, right? Um, so I can do test uh, demo one, and this will just run all the tests that I have in my package to make sure everything runs, right? So th this is this, that's actually the entirety of package development. Here I've already uh, I've already implemented a new package with two dependencies, um, tested one feature out of it. Now the, the interesting thing here is that unlike some of the other packages we looked at. Um, we do have to reference the internals of the package by using the package name. If you do want to be let your users be a bit lazy, you can do export g and h, 
And now you can, now when someone does using, you can directly just use G and H. If you don't, if, you know, if you don't want the exports of a given package, what you can do instead is you can do import demo one, and now you have to, now nothing is exported. So import means that nothing is exported. Using means that anything that someone has written in the package, you know, these are the variables we, we want to let you have, then those are directly accessible on the outside. So, I mean, with, with this is enough knowledge that you can now start digging open Julia packages and they're pretty easy to read, right? So for example, Modeling Toolkit is a symbolic programming library, kind of like SymPy or um, Kasadi. If you open it up here, you see that most of the code always starts in a file that is the same name as the package. So here, this is a module modeling toolkit. It imports a lot of packages defines a whole bunch of things. It includes a bunch of extra files. So this is how you tell it that you want to have, you know, more code in another file. You just use include, and then it exports a bunch of things. And then this is how it, it works on the outside where you then write a ton of tests. So that's package development in a nutshell. I'm going to show you now a, a few places where you can find a lot more information, but hopefully this gets you up and running, right? So I'm assuming that you have some programming background before, and this is helping you just figure out how to use you know, Julia in an effective manner, um, because I won't, you know, we want to get right to the meat of the course. So if you need more help, well, here's how you get it, right? So um, if you want a lot more, a much deeper introduction into Julia Lang package development, um, search for developing Julia packages. I did a full hour long demonstration uh, that has a lot more details on how do you do everything from writing in-depth tests, get your uh, continuous integration running, and pr pretty much everything, right? It's a whole hour. So I'm not gonna wanna recreate this. Um, take a look at this if you want all of those details, right? Uh, where do you get the most help with actually programming for the Julia programming language? Well, if you go to docs.julialang.org, the manual is a really great resource. It has details on way too much. So, you know, take a, take a look at this. It has both the manual on there and it also has all of the um, examples. And it also has all these standard libraries, right? So I mentioned that there are these standard libraries like linear algebra that bring in essential work or essential methods like uh, matrix inverses. So this is where you'd find all of that information. So the manual and the standard library are two things that you should get very comfortable with. Um, and also base. So the base libraries have a lot of these uh, functions like iterators and multi-threading. That's, that's where it all comes from. So you should be very familiar with this. The other resource that you should uh, become familiar with is uh, juliahub.com. So juliahub.com is this uh, browser for different Julia packages. So if you open up one, it'll tell you all about this package, tell you how to get to the documentation, um, it'll, it'll show you the documentation. Most Julia documentation looks like the same like this, so it'll tell you all about the functions that exist inside of the package, and um, it'll tell you which what what packages are dependent on it, which packages depend on it, and it'll give you the whole uh, graph. Um, if you don't, if you really don't know what you're looking for, you can also do something like look at code search, and you can do, for example, a good idea might be binary heap. And we can just search where, uh, what what has a binary heap. Um, let's see. Let's search in the documentation. And so this then gives you every package that, that I can find that mentions a binary heap. Um, I guess. Yeah, nearest neighbor descent might be the package you want, right? Or tracking heaps, right? So th this is how this is a nice way to be able to just kind of search around. I guess the repo search will just search in a bunch of different. Um, the text of all the different repos, and here is going to find the data structures.jl repo, which is the main uh, repository for data structures. So this is a very nice website to to go to if you're new to the Julia package ecosystem, because it will, um, I mean, it'll, it'll bridge you to all these different packages and show you how to get to their their documentation. So, um, if just to, as a last thing, if you're if you're feeling like you need a, a bit more because it's a new programming language. The julialang.org site has a lot of resources. Um, if you go to learn, there's a bunch of different tutorials for different sub portions, like with deep learning, with uh, data frames, um, 
uh, Alan Edelman's course on computational uh, modeling and computational thinking is also a very good one. Um, and uh, and so uh, I think that th this this will also lead you to some books. Um, of these books, the one that I know about the most is probably this Think Julia book. Think Julia is more for computer science. So if you're interested in learning, you know, from scratch, all the different details about array syntax and dictionary syntax, tuple syntax, and everything, this is an, a nice resource for that kind of thing. So if, if you if you like to have a reference book around, this is one that might be interesting. Um, if you want it something that is quick to just kind of get you up and running, there are a few good resources for that. So um, the one that I like the most is actually uh, noteworthy. Comparisons, Julia, if you just type that in, you should find this page, which is noteworthy differences from other languages. And this just says, if you know MATLAB, you know, Julia raised our index with square rep brackets instead of circle brackets because it's a sane language, right? Um, other things like, uh, you know, how do you use SVDs? What does it return? These differences that people have made note of for R users, Python users, MATLAB users, C++ users, right? There's a whole bunch of different languages in here. This is a good resource for if you know how to program and you're just trying to learn how to map it to a new language, here's where you go. Another, another resource to look at is the Quanti Con Cheat Sheet. And I'll be putting all these links on the uh, course website as well, but I'm just kind of giving the big overview. Um, so the Quanti Con Cheat Sheet is a great one for MATLAB, Python, Julia. So it's much more um, mathematical focused, where it just shows, you know, how do you get a row vector in the three languages? Well, here's MATLAB, here's Python, here's Julia. And it has about 100 different things, which are all lined up right next to each other. So it's a great resource if you just want to have something open. You're starting to get started with Julia. You know MATLAB or Python already. This might be a nice thing to have as a separate window or print out. Um, other deeper resources for, for just getting started is uh, Julia in X uh, Minutes. Um, Learn Julia in X Minutes has just a very nice, quick introduction. Um, it, this is also another nice one to, to keep open. Um, another one is the, the Julia wiki book. So introducing Julia. This one is more freeform. So for example, uh, what's one of the ones that I know? Working with text files. You know, so here it describes the open function. It gives a few examples, and it, it starts to tie these examples with other deeper. And you know, it, it has a nice uh, difficulty curve as it goes through the examples. So if you want something that is more of a full resource to kind of work through, uh, this might be a nice one. And the last one I'll point to is um, Intro to Julia. Um, if you type this in, you should find this deep introduction to Julia for, sci for data science and scientific computing. I wrote this a few years ago for giving workshops, and um, so uh, there has a lot of the explanation, right? I don't know if it's as good or or if it's better or worse than some of the other ones that you can take your pick, but it explains um, how to do a lot of the basic things. And now what you can find in here is a bunch of questions. So this one has a lot of questions and a lot of uh, example, you know, example homeworks. Um, so for example, if you want to just start playing with Julia, you can open up these basic problems and then look at how do you define string matrix? How do you do binomial, or how do you take random binomials? How do you calculate pi, pi with uh, Monte Carlo? And all of these problems have an answer sheet, which is also on here, the problem answer. So the basic problem answers are here and you'll find answer sheets. So if you wanna just kinda of get something, just to get coding in the language and just start trying to some things out, um, I'd, I'd point to these as some good examples to start with. So um, that ends our very quick introduction and what I wanna do next is I wanna get right into optimizing some serial code.